legacy. We come to worship the Lord on today because he's a mighty, mighty God. Hallelujah. Lord, you're mighty. 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 Oh Lord, 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 how excellent is your name in all the earth. You said your glory above the heavens and the earth. When I think of all you made, the sun, the moon, and the stars, no praise is high enough to express how great you are. What am I doing? future is a million little choices. Practice or play video games. Two hours in the gym or two hours at the movies. 
a little extra work or a little extra play. Reconcile or let the sun go down on your anger. Get up or push the snooze button again. Take a potential client to the game or take a kid from a broken home. Spend that bonus on yourself or give it to a ministry that reaches out to pregnant teens. If we could get a picture of the future, if we could jump ahead 10, 15, 20 years, and see the accumulation of our decisions, the chain of events we set in motion, how differently would we live today? How would we choose to spend our time? What would we walk away from? How would we treat the people around us? What would we choose to pursue with passion? Where would we choose to invest our skills and our resources? Your future is a million little choices. And it starts today. Praise the Lord, everybody. I am so excited to be back with you. After the service uh, on Easter Sunday that we had, I couldn't hardly wait to get back in front of the camera to just say, hallelujah, didn't we have a wonderful time? God was with us. We was live online and live on our very own parking lot. We had such great worship. We had a great time of worshiping our God in heaven, and we also had a great time fellowshipping with each other. Those of us that showed up on the parking lot, we hadn't seen each other. Some of us hadn't seen each other in months. It was so good to see you. I'm excited about what God is doing. Matter of fact, we intend to open our church up. Our contractor said that uh, they should be finish with everything by the end of May so that we can open up on the first Sunday in June. So mark the date, uh, Sunday, the first Sunday in June. That's our opening date for coming back into our building, and we're going to be live and in person. But until then, we're going to also have two more parking lot live services right here on our parking lot. We're going to be here on the 25th of April, right here on the parking lot and live online, and then also on that great day called Mother's Day. We're going to celebrate mothers like never before. We're going to have gifts and a little prepackaged food. Uh, you'll be able to take portraits. Every mother gets a free portrait, and not only a free portrait of yourself, but you'll be able to take a portrait with your family that you bring with you. So mark those dates, April the 25th and May 9th on the parking lot and online. I want to encourage all of you to get out to the parking lot, social distances. We can wear our masks and, and, and be safe, but yet fellowship and worship God. I'm excited. I cannot wait to see you in person. Now, until those dates, I still have to preach. And so this morning, I'm going to continue. What I started last week uh, at Easter uh, uh, in a new series called, It's Time for a Fresh Start. I believe if there's ever been a time in history, and even in our personal life, considering all that we have had to endure in our country and even across the world, it's time that we get a fresh start. And so today, I want to talk with you from the message entitled, Understanding God, Money, and Possessions. I think we should take a close look at God and what he says about the money that he allows to come into our lives. So stick with me. It's going to be a great, great 
encouraging message. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your grace, your mercy upon our lives. We thank you for all that you did on last week. We thank you, Lord, for the person online who gave their lives to their life to you. We thank you that even in the midst of what we are going through, you are still winning souls to the kingdom. Be with us today. Lead us through this message. Speak to us. Encourage us. Strengthen us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it was many years ago uh, when I was about 20, 21 years of age. I was attending a little small church, and uh, I loved that church. But there was one thing that I didn't like that much. And that's when it was offering time. Well, Pastor, you, you're always talking about being fair with God. You didn't like giving to, well, well, don't get me wrong. I love giving to God. And even then, I had learned to give to God. But man, the way they took up an offering. They didn't literally lock the door. No, they didn't lock the doors, but the ushers would stand at the back doors. No one could come in. No one could go out. And they would take up the offering. And when they finished quoting scriptures, most of the time out of context, whoo, you just felt bad. It drained all the good spirit out of you. And I can remember one year, it was the pastor's anniversary, and they made it a big deal. Five days we honored our pastor and his wife. Well, to be honest with you, I didn't really get with that either because it was such a stressful time. Matter of fact, I had a young friend. Yolanda and I were married, and this young man adopted me as his big brother. He had got saved, and his family was not, he didn't have a lot of support. He was trying to graduate from high school, and he was having such a hard time. And I can remember on the first night of the anniversary, they put so much pressure on us concerning money that the young man came that one night, and we didn't see him anymore. And then a couple of years later, we reconnected with him. He came by our house. And I simply ask him, man, it's so good to see you. What happened to you two years ago? And he said, big brother, that's what he called me. He says, big brother, and I want you to pay very close attention to this. He says, big brother, that night, that first night of the anniversary, and they were asking for money, and they were saying things like, you should have saved for it, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, I didn't have a job. I didn't have money. I tried to borrow money. I just didn't have any money. So after that first night, I decided I wasn't coming back to church until the anniversary was over. And then he says, while I was gone, I got caught up into that stuff I had been in and just never came back. And I looked at him. And my heart went out to him. It just hurt to hear him say that he quit coming to church because so much emphasis was on money. I thought I'd share that with you. Because as long as I've been pastor here and my first pastorate, I've never made money an issue. Matter of fact, in those early days, Whatever we did at church, I always calculated it based on if I could pay for it if the offering wasn't enough. Well, that's not fair with me and Yolanda, but that's what I did. And gave just tons of money to make sure I never had to pressure people for money. And likewise here, I never want to pressure anyone concerning money. I never want to turn anyone off. And that's why I want to talk about understanding God, money, and possession, because there is a balance. Now, uh, before I get into this message, back to my friend. After he left our little tiny apartment at the time, three weeks later, I heard a news report of a young man was on the city bus trying to defend 
a lady who was being attacked by a man on the bus. And in his attempt to protect someone, he didn't even know the young man was stabbed in the back of the neck and killed. And then I got a call and found out it was my little adopted brother. And I thought about what he said, the turnout and the pain of being pressured for money. And he just quit coming to church. I vowed to God then that money would never be an issue at any church. If God, you ever call me the pastor, I'll never make money an issue. And God has helped me keep my promise to God. And so today, I'm not going to try to pitch to you, I'm not trying to tell you a sad story. I'm just telling you a true story about how when we see and handle money in the church the wrong way, how it really can turn folks off who have a good heart for God, who really want to serve God. But when, when the term and, and the money, how we do money in church can hurt people and turn them off. And I vowed, and to this day I stick to it, money will never be an issue here at this church. That's why when I take up an offering, I have a phrase that I use most Sundays, and it's this, be fair with God. But with all of that said, and the story, and my commitment never ever to make money an issue, and I'm not gonna do it today, I think it's only right and fair with God that I help all of us to understand how money and possessions relate to God. Let's start in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. There. Then David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly. O Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel, may you be praised forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. He says, everything, this is King David, he says, everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. David got so excited, he just simply said, even this kingdom that you made me king over, God, is yours. He says, we adore you as the one who is all over things. You are the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone. For you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand. And at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. Oh, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I, he says? I, and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything we have, note this, he says, everything we have has come from you. And we give you only what you gave us first. What we give to you, what we give to God is only what he's already given to us. So we are giving back to God what already belongs to him. I said this to you a few months ago. The difference between Christians and those who don't acknowledge God Christians recognize that all the money and all the stuff that we accumulate comes from God. While others, that, that's those who don't recognize God, they think it came from just their hard work. Today, it's not my intentions to try to convince you 
to give money to God. I want to encourage you to love, honor, and respect God. That's my goal today. And money has a lot to do with that. But I, if you can leave with anything today, it is, I want you to love God more, honor him more, and respect him more. King David, he understood God, money, and possessions. And, and so let me share what David understood about God. He understood that God is great and powerful. He understood that God has glory, victory, majesty, and all honor belongs to God. He also understand, he also understood that everything in the heavens and on the earth belongs to God. David also understood because he declared concerning the kingdom he was king over. He got so excited about how awesome and wonderful God is. He declared, oh Lord, and this is your kingdom. This kingdom that you made me king over, uh, this kingdom that you, you've given me rule over is actually yours. That's a word to us. Everything that God gives to us Everything that he gives us authority over is really God. We are just managers. David also understood God is over all things. He's over all things. He also understood wealth and honor come from God. He also understood that God rules over everything. God is in charge of everything. I know sometimes it don't seem like it, but I'm just telling you, God rules over everything. He also understood that power and might are in God's hand. God's power and his strength are in God's hand. Not only that, God makes people great and gives them strength. It is God that elevates. It is God who takes down. That's what David understood about God. Here's what David understood about money and possessions. It's only two, but they're great. Here's the first thing. Everything we have comes from God. Everything. Everything. Here's the second one, the second thing that David understood about money and possessions. What we give is what God gave us first. Every time, whatever we give, money, time, effort, the use of our time and abilities and giftedness, and any of that that we give to God, it came from him. David understood that. And that's what I want us to understand, that everything that we have, money and possessions, come from God, and he's due love, honor, and respect because he has been great and good to us. This is what Jesus, when he was here on earth, Jesus talked about money twice as much as heaven and hell twice as much. Watch this. 16 of the 38 parables of Jesus had to do with money and possessions. There are over 500 verses about prayer and faith. There are over 2,000 verses about money and possessions. Matthew 6, 21 says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Reverend Billy Graham says this, if a person gets their attitude towards money straight, it will help straighten out almost every other area of their life. It's important that we get this attitude about money straight. So why is money so complex? Luke 16, 13 helps us to understand not only why money is so complex, but why Jesus and even God himself through Scripture spent so much time talking about money and possession. Luke 16, 33. No one can serve two masters. 
For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus makes it plain. You cannot serve God and money. Here are some misconceptions about money and possessions. Here's the first one. Having more money will make me more secure. Having more money will make me more secure. That's a misconception. Look at Proverbs 18, 11. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. People think the more money I have, the more secure I am. Uh, the more that I am above all the phrase of people and life. But here's the truth. You can have all the money in the world. <laughs> and get this, current event, you can still be touched by COVID-19. Having all the money in the world cannot secure you true love. Uh, you can get people to like you and say they love you because of what you have. But true love never comes from how much money and wealth that you have. Hebrews 13, beginning at verse 5, says this. Keep your lives free. I want you to pay very close attention to this. He says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because... Now, he didn't just say be content with what you have. He tells us, because God has said, never will I leave you. You don't have to depend on money. You don't have to trust and, and, and put all your faith in money because God himself said, never will I leave you. That's more than all the money in the world to have God on your side. He says, never will I forsake you. He's never, God is never, never, ever going to turn his back on you. That's why uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the writer of Hebrews said, we should learn not to love money and to be with content with what we have because God is never going to leave us or forsake us. And then he says, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. See, a lot of people are concerned about money because uh, money does bring some type of security, but it doesn't bring you the ultimate security because money can be taken from us, but not God. Not his love or his concern about us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And so the writer says, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. Let me say this to you. I would much rather have God as my helper than to have a bank account that I'm depending on. Because banks can be breached and my money can be stolen. But no one, no thing can separate me from the love of God because he is my helper. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I'm going to put my trust and my faith in God, not on the stuff and the wealth of life. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. And then he says, what can mere mortals do to me? There's nothing on this earth that people can do to me, can do to you, that God won't protect us against it. Here's another misconception about money and possession. See, because uh, having money uh, uh, will not make us more secure. It gives us that false security. Here, here's the second misconception about money and possession. The things I own 
define me. The things I own define me. Look at Luke 12, 15. Then he said, this is Jesus, beware, guard against every kind of greed. He says, life is not measured by how much you own. Guard yourself against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Many people are obsessed with getting stuff. They're not content with two good cars that gets them back and forth to work and recreation and leisure. You gotta have three, four, five cars. He says, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Let's quit thinking that we are defined by what we have. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 10 says, those who love money will never have enough. When we love money, when we love stuff, we will continue to try to accumulate it. We will become obsessed with it because we will never have enough. When we get on this track that I got to have this and I got to have that, it will drain us of all our time and energy that we could be spending in the work of the Lord. And every single time we allow ourselves to go down that road of loving money and loving stuff, it'll never be enough. We will never be content. We will always want more. And what I found about people who simply just want more and more and more money, more and more stuff, they have less, less time for God. When we're spending all our time accumulating stuff, it steals our time from God that we could be spending doing the work of the ministry. Doing the work of the ministry. How dangerous to think that wealth brings true happiness. It doesn't. This is not a message to try to convince you to have less in life. No, 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 no. This is not a message uh, to try to convince you uh, that, that, that you shouldn't have nice things. That's not what I'm saying. Because there is a balance. We cannot love money and stuff more than we love God. It's nothing wrong with having nice cars, nice clothes, living in a nice neighborhood, all of that. It's nothing wrong with any of that. What becomes wrong with it is when we put it before God. When we don't take time to give back to God what already belongs to him, it's dangerous for us to spend our lifetime, however much time God gives us, it is dangerous for us to spend that time chasing stuff. We should be chasing after God. Because when we chase after God, he will be found. And when we find God, that's where our true happiness, joy, and peace really come from. Because it is only God who can fulfill what's on the inside of us. This stuff in this life is only temporary. It's only what we do for Christ that's going to last. This is why I want to talk with you with all passion and love concerning you that you understand God, money, and possession. Because when you get a balance in that, you can serve God. God has called each and every one of us to the ministry. Every one of us have a part in the ministry. It's not just the preachers and the deacons who work for God. It's the whole body of Christ. But what I've understood and what I've learned as a pastor is this. When people struggle concerning money, 
when people don't understand what money is all about, they spend all of their time trying to chase and get money, thinking it's going to bring them happiness, and they put God on hold. As a pastor, many, many times over the years, people have said to me, Pastor, when I do this, or when I do that, or when I get this much money, or when I get this kind of job, I'm, I'm just kind of trying to get it all together, then I'll be able to help you at church, not just financially, but I'll be able to give the church some of my time because I've done this and that. And they leave God out of the equation because they don't know how to trust God. They haven't learned to be content where they are and put everything in perspective so that they can serve God and yet have some things in life that they desire. It's a balance. It's about being fair with God. It's about not kicking God to the curb until I get what I want. It's about going to God first who said that if we seek his kingdom first, I told you about this, Four weeks in a row with grown folks' faith, I told you, if you seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, Jesus said, I'll add all the stuff to you. In other words, if you take care of God's business, he's going to take care of yours. And this is what I'm trying to help us understand about God, money, and possession. When we have this great relationship with God, when we have our trust as David did, when we understand that everything that we have, everything on earth, all belongs to God, when we begin to understand that, when we begin begin to walk in it, when we begin to just rest in it, we can have peace with God that passes all understanding. And because we have this peace that passes all understanding, I don't think you're getting this here, but when you begin to just trust God, put your life in his hand and quit worrying about the stuff, then God is going to add it, the stuff to you. He's going to add it to you. Life is much more than what you own. Love of money. When we have that love for money, it'll never be enough. Listen to what Romans chapter 4, starting at verse 7 says. If you want true happiness, here's where to find it. Happy are they who sins are forgiven. Happy. You remember every time, especially when you first came to Christ and you got your sins forgiven, what joy brought to you now every time you mess up and go to God, you don't go with fear, you go with, with humbleness and simply say, God, I messed it up. What a relief it is and how good you feel. And then your joy and your happiness come back. He, he said, happy are they whose sins are forgiven, whose wrongs are pardoned. Just done away with. Happy is the person whom the Lord does not consider guilty. When God takes away all the guilt from our life, from all the mess that we've done, that brings happiness. Somebody ought to be saying, hallelujah, I'm forgiven because that's true happiness. I want to close. I want to close by giving you four things about money and God. Here's the first one. Giving is a voluntary act. God doesn't force us. He doesn't make us give to him. Giving is generous. God expects, he doesn't make, but he expects for us to give to him and not only give to him and his work, his kingdom, he expects us to be giving generous. Here's the third one. Giving to God is evidence of commitment to him and passion 
for his kingdom. Let me say that to you again. Giving to God is evidence of commitment to him and passion for his kingdom. Every time we give to God, it's evidence not only that we are committed to God, but we love, honor, and respect him. That's why every week when I get paid, I give back to God what already belongs to him and is my way of saying, thank you, God for providing for me. I honor you. I acknowledge that you are the one who made this money possible for me. And for that, I give back to you and I thank you for it. And here's the next one. Giving is the essence of us giving to God sacrificially. Sacrificially. Here's where I'm going to close. Giving to God sacrificially. Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 41. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. This widow woman, poor. I've heard people to say, I'm too poor to give. No, we are not. Jesus said, the rich people put all this money in, but it was just a drop in a bucket to them because they had so much. God wants us to give proportionally. That's why I say to you that 10% is a good start. Yolanda and I have given 10%, gave 10% for years. We're probably up to about 13% now if you count. Because we understand the principle of sowing and reaping in God's kingdom. See, God has given many of us so much and just like he watched in the temple right now, this is not a guilt trip, this is true. See, because God is waiting for an opportunity to fulfill all that you want fulfilled in your life. But he wants to be shown love, honor, and respect. And one of the ways that we do that is to take what he gives us and give back to him. It's important that we understand that principle about God. He wants to be acknowledged that he is the true and living God. And we do that by honoring him with our time, money, resources, gifts, and all the abilities that he has given us. That's how we do it, by just simply, not just saying it, but taking action. Now, all over the place, I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to do part two next week of this message. But right where you are, take a moment to think about how fair you have been to God, considering all that he has given you. Just think about it. And then think about how consistent have you been giving to God, even though every week he blesses us. Think about it. 
because it's about giving God what's due him. Love, honor, and respect. Think about it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a giving God. You gave your only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should have life and live. So, Father, as we take this moment to honor you and think about all that you have done for us, help our heart, God, to want to do the right thing concerning giving to you. And then, God, there may be some people watching who has never, ever, considering all that you've done for them, they have never, ever given their life to you and said, God, this is your life. Do what you want with it. They've never done that, God. There may be someone there. And if that's you, this is the time for you to give your life back to God. For after all, he is the one who gave you life. And you just pray this prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I ask you to forgive me for all my mistakes, all the bad stuff that I've done. I ask you to forgive me. And Jesus, come into my heart and become the Lord of my life, meaning I'm going to let you run my life now. I'm going to listen to your voice. Jesus, come into my heart right now and help me. Father, I thank you for forgiving me. Jesus, I thank you for coming into my heart to lead and guide me. I accept it right now. In Jesus' name, amen. And now for the rest of us. Let us all pray this prayer. Father, I ask you to forgive me for not being fair with you, considering all that you have done for me. I ask you to forgive me. And as I move forward right now, getting a fresh start in the area of money and possessions towards you, I ask you to not only forgive me, but lead me and guide me as I start fresh today and give to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, concerning our offering today, I don't need to say anything else. You've encountered truth, so now let's give. Many have already given. Uh, many uh, have sent their offering in through the mail, and now uh, you online, you have an opportunity to, to give. Just go ahead, let God speak, and you give how God has prospered you, what he puts in your heart to do. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you for this offering. We pray people are stirred to be fair with you and to give as you have prospered them. We thank you for in Jesus' name, amen. That's it. That's how it works. It's just simple. Being fair with God because he's been so great to us. I'm going to do part two next week. And, 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 and I'm going to finish up on this because it's important. If we're going to have a good, fresh start, got to get this money issue uh, understood and behind us so we can operate in the prosperity of God, not the prosperity of man. God bless you. I love you. I'll see you next week. God bless.